how a large majority of people who grew up in Jehovah's Witness don't stay. No, they don't. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. wow, that's... I, it surprised me. It sounds like, like Mormons. Like, they can't wait to be 18 to get out of there. Huh. No, it, Am- Am- Amish. I'm sorry. Amish. Oh, oh okay. Mm-hmm. It just surprised me. Yeah, um, I heard that too. That a huge turnover. A lot of them yeah. reject it. And then most of the people um, who turn who are Jehovah's Witness are people who first generation. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, some of them are second generation, but just not as many. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was weird. I was yeah. talking to Tariana one day. And she decided to check out Jehovah's Witness. Uh-huh. And she was there for like three months. And then she's like, you know what, I've had enough. Because she just, she didn't, she was starting to disagree with things. Because uh-huh. what, she said it sounds, sounds all good. Sounds good at the beginning. Yeah. And then once you really start getting in there, then the lies start coming out. It's like, it's like, up. it's like Mormonism. You know what makes me laugh is a woman Mormon. Because Mormons have no, like, there's no... Sexual equality between women are women. nothing to them right? except breeding. Right, and like women actually think that this is a good thing to believe in. It's like, do you know what your eternity consists of? Having babies. Having babies for him yeah. forever. You don't get to actually enjoy With things. With other women like, too. <laughs> right, like there there will be like a group of women there. Like, do you know what your religion you like teaches? <laughs> I mean, they're barely turning fourteen. They already have fathers picked up husbands for them and all yeah. that. <laughs> well, anyway, sorry for getting off topic. I just thought that was funny. All right. Well, do you guys know what an elm tree is? Mm-hmm. What? An elm tree? Yep. Yeah. They're we like weeds out here. Up. Yeah. They're like weeds. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, they, they, they come up all over the place. And you know, the thing about their root systems are, is that their root systems are very destructive. You guys yeah. know that? They'll get into all the other stuff that's going on. And they'll just tear the crap out of it. And they'll grow up by buildings and stuff yeah. and ruin their foundations. Yeah, they'll mess up. Yeah, they'll mess up foundations. They'll mess up everything. Th- this is a picture right here of this uh, elm tree that they were taking out. Here's the elm tree here, and there, here's the root system. Oh, wow. This tree is only six to seven years old. Wow! Wow! Okay. And the root system was so intense that what they had to do, where's my mouse? There it is. They actually had to cut these out. I saw the after picture. They had to cut these out. Okay, like that, get a, like a chainsaw. Then they had to tie a bobcat onto it here and pull it back. And then as it came up, they had to keep cutting as it was coming up. They couldn't get all the roots out. They had to just cut their losses and, and find a spot to cut off. Wow. After six to seven years. Okay. Um, elm trees, like I said, are they're like weeds. They will grow anywhere that there's enough water for them to grow. Then once they have grown large enough, they they whenever they go into their I guess it's like I don't know what you call it, but a, a tree's pollination. Whenever they go into their pollination season, they drop all kinds of stuff all the ground. It, just, it gets yeah. everywhere, um, and they're very invasive in the sense that 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 um, they'll well I mean they'll grow up in a a a. Um, sidewalk and they'll just like yeah. tear it apart. You know what I mean? They're they're very invasive. They go everywhere. Really everywhere. There's no way to keep them out. Over at the church in our in our flower bed there, I've got two elm trees I've got to take out. Can you believe it? Yeah. And it, it was just lying there somewhere on the ground, I guess, until the water hit it, and then it just decided, hey, okay, I'll grow. You know what I mean? Uh, just look at that. It's very dangerous to other plants. Anybody who has roses around here knows. They'll come up right in the middle of your roses, and and if you don't do anything about it, They'll actually take the life from your roses, grow up in the place of your roses, and you won't have a rose there anymore. They'll kill it. They, they, they get in there. They won't come out, and they'll just – so people always ask, why don't we just ignore them? You know, Why don't we just let well enough alone and just – we do our thing, and they'll do their thing. Joe's Witness are like elm trees. You can't just do nothing because this is what they do. They get their roots in there. They tear up everything else. They kill the life that's, that's there. They can't go unchallenged. That's something. And when I say unchallenged, I'm not saying a few things. I'm not saying we need to go burn down the Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall. I'm not saying that. (laughs) I'm also not saying that we have to go attack them. I'm also not saying we need to go get in arguments with them and look for fights. I'm not saying any of those things. Okay. 
I'll explain by the end of the lesson what I do mean, but I just want to clarify that right now. I'm not talking about violence. I'm not talking about ignorance. I'm not talking about stupidity. Okay. So, uh, before we actually get into the lesson, I wanted to look at a few things that's, for lack of a better word, embarrassing. Um, th these are just a short list of the different things that they've changed dates on. Last days began originally in 1780 or 90-something. Then it was changed to, I think it was 1914. Uh, start of Jesus' invisible presence was in the 1800s. Then it was changed to the 1900s. Um, Jesus became king in heaven in the 1800s. Then it was turned to the 1900s. Um, and the end of the world started in 18-something, then 1914, then 1925. And I mean, really, on honestly, they keep going on and on about Armageddon, and, and they keep changing the dates about it. Um, and, I mean, Chuck and I were talking about, you know, oh, well, Abraham and, and, and these others are going to – they're, they're going to come and they're going to appear. There's two different prophets. I don't remember. Well, and then they had another one where um, the, the um, Old Testament saints from Hebrews, like chapter 11 or whatever, yeah. they were going to come. And uh, like the I guess – I don't really understand where they were going with that one. But anyways, like they had all these different prophecies. Oh, this is going to happen. And just, just so you know that I'm not being dramatic – I found a website that has a list of their predictions over a hundred hundred year period, and I'm going to scroll through them so you can see how many. Okay, all right. Uh -huh. Just so you know, I'm not exaggerating, and I'll give you the link if you want it. I'm not exaggerating on this. Um, and and here's something um, that I want you guys to be thinking about while while we're talking about Jehovah's Witness. They claim what do they claim? They have the truth, right? Everybody else is wrong. They have the truth, right? If they have the truth, why has it been wrong so often? Why has it been wrong so often if they have the truth? That everybody else is wrong, remember? Everybody else is wrong. And so Charles Russell had to enlighten the world. But they were wrong on all these different things. How can they be wrong so often if they're the ones who have the truth? Okay? Um, and why don't any serious scholars or linguists support their view? Why are they the only people who support their view? Why is that a thing? You know what I mean? Archaeology doesn't back up their opinions. Uh, lingu uh, linguistic studies doesn't back up uh, back up their conclusions. Uh, scholarship doesn't back up their uh, – Greek scholars, Hebrew scholars, nobody backs up their view. No serious scholar backs up their view. <laughs> they back up their view simply by saying it loud enough, frequently enough. I honestly don't know how they even have a following at this point. Our view is right. <laughs> Do what? I said our view is right. <laughs> our view is right. It's right because we believe it. Shut up and listen. Yeah. <laughs> Join the collective. The collective. <laughs> they remind me of the cyborg. Oh my gosh, yes, the cyborg. <laughs> anyways, anyways, I'm just having fun. Um, these are uh, two websites I wanted to show you guys. Um, excuse me if I can get to it. There we go. Um, the first one is called JW Facts. You're going to want to write that one down. This is the one I use a lot, and I'm going to show you real quickly um, just uh, – <coughs> do you shift it? Is that what you do? Shift click? Yeah, there we go. Um, it is a – I just really love this one. They always have all these different uh, interesting things. Um, and then the book that I want you to look at is called The Kingdom of the Cults. Um, it is – I, I, I have. Okay, yeah, I already mentioned it to you guys a hundred times. I know you have it. Um, really just a great – just a great work. Oops, it opened up on the wrong page. It opened up on my computer rather than on the screen. Here we go. Boop. There we go. It's loading. Might take a minute, but it's getting there. I went to type it in and it turned to takefacts.com. What? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, right here at the top of jwfacts.com, you'll find these different things right here, okay? This is what you need to be concerned about. Has the core scandal changes doctrine and just interesting things and quotes okay they have a real nice breakdown really in-depth information and the thing about this site is they actually use the JW facts from the JWs themselves okay they don't they don't no no no, no. this is not the Jehovah's jo Witness oh, website okay. they just use the Jehovah's Witness writing to show that they're not twisting what they said they are quoting exactly what they said okay um, really just a great in-depth thing here um, this right here is an article on the on the Feld predictions. 
Just that's all that this article is right here, and look how long long it is. Yeah. Wow. Uh, uh, uh. See, I mean, they really go in depth about stuff. Um, and if you look right here, they even make nice little charts for you. This is Russell's chronology of the end times. 1799, the last days began. 1874, start of Jesus' invisible presence. 1878, Jesus became king in heaven. 1914, the end of the world. Then Rutherford, um, who was, I believe, the guy immediately after him, um, so. changed it to all those things. Last days began, start of Jesus' invisible presence. Jesus became king in heaven to 1914. And then uh, it was 1925 was the end of the world, but then it was within months, and he just changed it a hundred times. Um, and well, that's just a, an example of how of how they uh, how the website is really just a great website. I mean, if you go up here, like for instance, let's click on doctrine. This is just uh, uh, hands down. Uh, every Christian should have this this website uh, tagged in their in their web browser. I mean, it's just bookmarked in their web browser. It's just a fantastic website. They really did a great time on or a great job on this. All right, here you can see Jehovah, God's name. The last days, mediator, mediator for only the 144,000. 144,000, a literal number. Do you see how they have all these different yeah. articles? And this is all about their all about their doctrine. And they take it and they analyze it. They say this is what it says. I'll even pull one up. I'll go to um, last days. If it'll load up. My computer doesn't like it when I'm doing something on the internet while recording. It always gives me a little bit of a hassle when I do that. This, this website, when I was writing about the Jehovah's Witness before, I used this one as much as the Kingdom of the Cults book. I just found it phenomenal. So you can see there, um, they have this introductory thing right here, and then they, they, they t end up talking about it. And see right here, this is a quotation from the Jehovah's Witness uh, magazine called The Watchtower. From, it was published in 1894. It's released on July 15th, and it was on page 224. See, so it, just in case you know where to turn to, you, they're not taking it out of context, you see it right there. See what I mean? And if you want to, you can go to the library and look it up yourself. See what I mean? They're always very in-depth about it. I really appreciate whoever it is that uh, started this website. They don't um, have no about me. Um, I didn't really look. I was too interested in studying their different articles. I was like, man, I found a gold mine. Um, mm -hmm. Let me pull up that other one for you just so you can see the different uh, predictions. <sighs> Bible.com slash Yeah. And when you see this, you I mean, literally, I I laughed so hard when I saw this. Like, they went all in depth about it, but it's just like date after date after date after date. I was going to start trying to write some of this stuff down, and I was like, it's just too much. There's just, it's just too much. All right, so I'll start scrolling down, okay? These, these are the dates, 1877, 1879, 1880, and I'll read a few of them. The end of this world that is the end of the gospel and the beginning of the millennial age is nearer than most men suppose. Indeed, we have already entered the transition period, which is to be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation. That's from uh, Three Worlds in the Harvest of This World, page 17. Christ came in the character of a bridegroom in 1874 at the beginning of the gospel harvest. And then, you know, it goes through with the different dates there. Here's another one. Uh, we need not here repeat the evidences that the seventh trump began its sounding in AD 1840. That's in Revelations, the seventh trumpet. Yeah. That's what he's talking about, okay? Um, and will continue until the end of the time of trouble and the end of the times of the Gentiles, AD 1914. So they're setting specific dates, and later they're going to say this. I'm not going to show you, but later they say this. Oh, we never said that. And then they say another date, and then then when it passes, they say, oh, no, we didn't say that. If you're interested in those, you can read through this. But obviously, as you can tell, I'm just going to scroll. Yeah. See all those dates that are going by? Uh-huh. Now, was it them, or who was it that we said that when they would um, change something like the dates for that, they would get rid of, like, the old writings that had stuff in it? I don't remember because, um, I don't remember. But the Jehovah's Witness stuff is still, you can still find the find the magazines and stuff from the, from the print. Um, oh, I, th I know the Mormons did that with some of their stuff. Um, they just kind of took it out. 
Um, but I don't remember specifically who that was. Seems like maybe that one where um, it was the woman that led it. The uh, Christian Science? Yeah. I don't remember that. Yeah. But anyways, so that's how long of a list that that was. I was just put holding down my finger on it, and all those dates went by. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are all the different times that they said, oh, here's a prediction. And most of them say, oh, yeah, that other prediction, just kidding about that. <laughs> so uh, go and check it out if you want. Really just a great um, – Great thing there. These are some more resources if you're interested, okay? Uh, the Watchtower, that's that's their main uh, magazine article thing. Uh, Says in the Scripture, that's a book, I believe, by Russell. Um, Millions Now Living Will Never Die. I don't remember who that was by. Vindication, I believe, is by Rutherford. Truth That Leads to Eternal Life, I don't know who, that one, who wrote that one. The Nation Shall Know That I Am Jehovah, I also don't remember who wrote that one. So, yeah. I can read one if you want me to. Yeah, read Matthew 7, 15 through 20. I'll read Deuteronomy. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 4 says this. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass... If it comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not shown, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether, you're love, whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. He didn't say if they say something and it doesn't happen. He says if, the, if this supposed prophet says something and it does happen, they do show you signs and miracles. They do something supernatural. And then they say, let's go and serve other gods. Don't listen. Okay? God does not contradict himself. He already gave us a revelation. He's not going to give us a separate revelation. So that's the first thing. But then, down in chapter 18, verses 20 through 22, he says this. If a prophet okay, says something and it doesn't happen. Where is it? Here it is. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that, that that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word of the the word that the Lord has um, not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. Basically, I don't lie. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. So, go ahead and read Matthew. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but, in, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. Yeah. And see, people turn on the like this. What about Jim Jones? He was doing some good things. He was doing some, some, some good things for the community with his farms and different things. And See what I mean? Like, he did some good things. Or what about Planned Parenthood? Yeah, they did cut. They, did, they were selling uh, baby fetuses. They, they did do that. But they do some good things, too. So... But then they say, well, what about those Christian ministers who have affairs or who molest children? What about those? And what he's talking about here is that the condition of the heart always shows itself. Those ministers who got busted for adultery, that shows where their heart was at, doesn't it? It doesn't matter if you're, if you're a Pentecostal, if you're Catholic, or if you're Jehovah's Witness. It shows where your heart's at. But then it also says something else. Did you, who in this community is doing something for the community? Pretty much everybody except the Jehovah's Witness. Pretty much. They just kind of sit over there and do their own thing. Everybody else is doing something for the community. Everybody else. I mean, it, it's it's almost like gotten to the point of, of, okay, it's a little ridiculous. You know what I mean? And the reason why we do things in the community is because... We are serving God. See what I mean? 
And nobody ever can say that he loves God and not have compassion for his neighbor. That just doesn't happen. You see what I mean? So why was the food pantry? Why did the food pantry open? Because there was a need. See what I mean? Whereas people who aren't seeking after after the Lord, they're gonna they're gonna do things out of out of the abundance of their heart, whatever it is. See what I mean? Like for instance, people who love money and all they think about money is they just have a have a love for money. And they're just constantly seeking money. They're gonna do things that are considered more immoral. Why? Because that's where their heart's at. See what I mean? From from what's inside it comes outside always. Nobody ever just says something out of their mouth that they haven't been thinking about for a long time, and this is oh no, I didn't mean it because you did mean it. You've been thinking about it in your heart. Yeah, it's it's been in there, and that's what he's He's talking about yes some bad people would do good things and some good people will do bad things too you know what I mean um, it's not he, he's using a he's using an extreme example to show to show the lesson so does Planned Parenthood do some good things yes they do do they do do some good things but they also sold baby fetuses see what I mean like that's not something that you just turn your back on see what I mean that kind of makes sense those ministers who committed adultery they need to be brought to justice the, the the people who 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 abused a child or or was involved in some other sexual scandal with a the child they need to be brought to justice justice does need to happen see what I mean does that make sense so anyways I hope I didn't just bring up more confusion all right with that we start who started the Jehovah's Witness Charles Russell Charles Russell does anybody know anything about him? He started Jehovah's Witness <laughs> <laughs> You know the thing is, is he actually looks like he, got, he looks like a, like a nice guy from the pictures, you oh, know. I didn't see him. Just he just looks like your average grandpa, long beard, you know, <laughs> gentle face. Maybe I have some. Yeah. Well, everybody back then had long beards. If you were religious, you had a long beard. Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody else know anything about him? <clears throat> no. Okay. Well, let's 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 talk a little bit about him. His name was Charles Russell. Check out that. And he was born 1852 and died in 1916. Um, and uh, he uh, he was in his 60s, I think, when he died. 62, I think. Um, but one thing that was brought up when we were talking about the Jehovah's Witness before, like last year, I think it was. Um, was the thing about um, what happened in 1914. All that prophecy, what happened in 1914. I don't know how he did it, but something did happen in 1914. World War I started. I don't know how he did it. I, I don't know how he did it. He was actually right about something happening, but what he said was going to happen on that date was wrong. But something did happen on that day. So, I mean, I mean on that date. So, that's I mean, that's pretty important. Got it down to the year, at least. But he told us to worship other gods. <sighs> and he died in 1916. I think, honestly, that he thought that that was the end. I think he went to the grave thinking, you know, this is this is the uh, Armageddon. And then when World War I ended, I think Rutherford was like, whoops, we missed that one. <laughs> but anyways. Um, I... Although although a lot of people nowadays in Jehovah's Witness claim that they're not I don't have anything to do with Charles Russell, the core doctrine is exactly the same. It hasn't changed. The dates have changed. Uh, the specific those those kinds of specifics have changed. The prophecy and stuff that's you know, but the core of Jehovah's Witness is still the same. Their views on 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 uh, Jesus and everything it's it's the same. If you do a comparison of the you, you don't see any major breaks. Um. This is just a little bit about Char about who Charles Russell is as a man. He was a con man. Yeah. Yeah. He uh, claimed to sell sell this miracle wheat that you know was going to do something. It was just ordinary wheat. That was it. It didn't grow any better. It didn't do anything better. It was just normal wheat. Um, he pretend he pretended pretended to have speaking engagements in different uh, places around the world. He even had articles written and stuff, but he never had the crusades that he claimed to have had. The, oh yeah, people would say, oh yeah, he came into town, but nothing happened. He just came and then left. But he claimed <laughs> that there were hundreds of people and that you know, uh, so many different different conversions. That didn't happen. 
Um, he was an uneducated man. I think in total he had seven years of schooling, and none of that was anything above like you know, uh, like any college, like you know that kind of elementary. Right, right. It was none of it was like higher education. Oh. You know what I mean? Huh. Um, so he didn't. As far as I can tell, he didn't even have that much of normal education. Um, he was a self-proclaimed pastor. He he always talked about how he was a pastor and how people saw him as a pastor. But when asked, so who instituted you as a pastor? Nobody instituted him as a pastor. That's not the state, not anybody. He just called himself a pastor, and people called him pastor because he called himself pastor. Was that normal those days? Like now you have to be registered back then, was it? You know, I'm not real sure about the practice, but I believe you had to be at this time. I believe you still had to be recognized by organization. Like the Methodist, for instance. Uh, you were a Methodist pastor if you were recognized by the Methodist. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Uh, but I don't know if they had the op option to go under the state like they do now. I don't know. But I know that you had to be recognized by your uh, denomination. Um, he was a perjurer. That is, he claimed to have, he claimed to have all this knowledge, but then in, in court he lied about it. Some somebody said, you know, hey, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, and so he took them to court, and so he had to disprove what they claimed against him, and he couldn't do it because it was true. Mm. And then he said, oh yeah, I know Greek, I know I know a lot lots of Hebrew and whatnot. And then they said, so can you identify this word? And he said, no, I cannot. So can you identify the alphabet? No, he could not. So I mean, and it's official court transcripts. You can go look it up for yourself. Like this is all recorded historical fact. It's not like people are are flinging mud at Charles Russell. This is this is proof of who he is. Um, he's a self-proclaimed prophet, you know. I was, you know, how he's the mouthpiece of God. You know, you know, God is is, is speaking through me. Um, a warmonger. He was always talking about how everybody was evil. Uh, he went on and on about how uh, priests and pastors were gonna were gonna face God's wrath for being used by Satan and all these different things and you know thing after thing about just causing causing rough feelings. And you know, the Bible is a lot about forgiving your enemies and all these kinds of different things. They don't practice those kinds of things. Their their mindset is, is God smite everyone who's not agreeing with me. I'm right, um, you know. So uh, very arrogant. He he was off, he he wrote about how he nobody could really understand the Bible apart from his writings. I mean, you could read the Bible, but it wouldn't be made clear to you unless you had his called. You oh, have to. No, 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 no. He could he could read. Um, but I meant he wasn't um, real educated. Real, yeah, like like you know he didn't know any of the you know, ancient languages or anything like that. Higher education, but he did know how to read. Um, uh, what was I going to say about that? Uh, but anyways, uh, you know, always talking about how how you know, almost like in fact he I can't remember exactly how he said it, but he said somewhere along the lines of if you didn't have the Bible and you had my writings. That's all you would really need. I remember exactly how I worded it, though, so don't quote me on that exact, but he worded it somewhere around there. Um, and so then we get the New World, New World Translation from the Jehovah's Witness. Does any, before I do that, does anybody know anything about the New World Translation? Has anybody used it before or read it from it before? I've, I've, um, well, I, I have that. Uh, how to witness to Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever it is that... Um, What's the, and it has scriptures from that uh -huh. show you the differences in that. And, and was there anything that stuck out to you? Um, it's been a while since I read it, so I, I don't really know. Okay. All right. No, that's fine. I just wanted to ask. Um, so it's called the New World Translation. Um, as far as who translated it, we don't know. It could have been a cat from outside. We don't know. <laughs> They say this is so that they don't get the glory for God's word, but on that same note, we also don't have any way of verifying the, its validity. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean if you're going to have a translation of the Bible that contradicts every other translation of the Bible, you need to have authorized people, people who are scholars, who are recognized by the public. And the, and the New World Translation contradicts every other Bible translation. So, I mean, that's something, if you're going to make that kind of a claim, you need to have some kind of a stance for it. Charles Russell had no um, qualifications for his Greek or Hebrew, and yet he disagreed with all of Christendom when it came to whether Jesus was God, whether the Holy Spirit was God, what's going to happen in the end times, whether there's eternal judgment. Every, all these, everything major doctrine that Christians ha have, he contradicted. 
If you're going to make those kinds of contradictions, you need to have some qualifications. Grace, can you get the point? Um, so it's an unsupported translation. And what I mean by that, there is there is no scholarship who says this translation is good. Yeah. And it's a very biased translation. If you've ever read it, you can tell that they wanted it to say something, so they made it say that. And then the parts that they couldn't make say that, they uh, give their stupid little commentary about. They give they give their little commentary about. Uh, a good example of this is when Jesus is dying on the cross. Um, now remember, they don't believe. Uh, you know, they 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 retranslate the word about about um, about God's breath or whatever. Okay, so in one translation they talk about um, how he died, and in the other translation they have to translate it a different way because. The, they were trying to, you know, twist the words of scripture. I don't really want to get into it that much. I'm just trying to. I, I think my example might have been a poor one because I just don't want to, to explain what I'm talking about. Is going to actually take more time than it's worth. So pretend like I said something cool. Awesome. Um, maybe we'll go into that some other time. But we went into it last time we talked about the Jehovah's Witness, so I'm not overly concerned about it. Um, but anyways, let me kind of clarify. Because I won't be able to say that, but I'll be able to kind of clarify what I'm saying. They'll, like, they'll use scripture as much as they can to twist it into their wording. But then if there's another part of scripture that says basically the same thing, they'll try and, like, twist it where it's cohesive with the other one, but they'll use different words in both places. And under their own rules, one Greek word can only translate to one English word. And so they kind of catch themselves in a little trap. You know what I mean? Where they're trying to twist the words of it, but it's like, well, you just said that over here, but this is a different word over here. How does it translate to the same word? See what I mean? And so, anyways, long, long story. Um, so, who is, uh, who, what is God's name? No, I'm asking you guys, what is God's name? Doesn't have a name. Aw. I am who I am. Okay. All right. I know you guys brought up um, brought up Jehovah. Uh, were you just bringing up what the Jehovah's Witness say? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's what you meant, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Oh. Okay. Um. So I mean, going back to what you guys were saying about God's name, I am. That's from Exodus. Yeah. Um. What else about God's name? If you you ask what we think. Or yeah, what you think. think? Yes, what you think. Oh, yeah, oh. yeah. I want to hear your guys' opinion. In the Bible, it says that the Alpha and Omega. Okay. The, yeah, the Alpha and Omega. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, Revelations always also talks about a name that 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 only he knows. Yeah. Okay. Also talks about um, his character, and that's related to his name. Provider. Provider, exactly. These are things that redeemer. Yeah. Because that's something that he's done, and it's a name that gives him glory for that. Um, but anyways, going to their their view, um, here's a main point as to why Jehovah's Witness is completely wrong about God's name being Jehovah. Hebrew doesn't have any J's. Like letter J's? Yeah. J, J. It doesn't have that. You know what Joshua is in Hebrew? Yeshua. It doesn't have any J's. So how could it, how could they, and where do they get this from in the Bible? Exodus chapter 3. Where was Exodus written in? Hebrew. Moses, what languages did Moses speak? Probably he spoke the Egyptian language, and probably he spoke Hebrew. <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there. And God gave him the name in Hebrew, or at least it was recorded in Hebrew. Um, I have a question. Like, in my language, it starts with I. Uh-huh. So, would that make any difference, just because in English it starts with J? Not really, no. It's just um, different languages have different things. Like, oh. um... Jehovah, I'll look. I'll tell you this in a second. But Jehovah comes to English through Latin, okay, which is where we get the Jehovah. 
Okay, mm -hmm. but if you use through um, from Hebrew uh, down to English, uh, it comes out to Y H W H. Okay, which some people then say maybe Yahweh, but we don't we don't know that for fact. We don't know what's missing. Yeah, we don't know what's missing. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but so every every different language is going to be a little bit different and what it translates down to because every language is different. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. so, um, but Hebrew doesn't have any J's, so Jehovah couldn't possibly be God's name as given to Moses. That's the first point of contention. The second is this: Hebrew didn't have any vowels. It was added much later by scholars, much later. So how do you get along to Jehovah? The E. J, ho, the O, and the A, fa. Where do you get those vowels from? So how do you know for a fact this is God's name, and that's just that you have to specifically mention this name? Where do you get that from? See what I mean? Uh, the the name Jehovah comes to English through Latin. Um, so it really doesn't have anything to do with Hebrew that way either. So I mean, like, it, I really don't understand why they're so hell bent on his name being Jehovah. I don't get it. Um, what it what it comes down to us is Y H W H. I just mentioned this, possibly Yahweh, but we really don't know. As you can tell, uh, <clears throat> Yahweh and Jehovah have vowel breaks in different places. Do you see that? So. Um, this is from Exodus 3, 3, 14 through 15, where he says, you know, hey, this is my name. I am who I am, or I, I will be what I will be. Um, go and tell them that, that this is my name. And then he says, this is my, this is what I am to be called. Um, and so I think that's where they get it from. But one vague passage with, okay, so go ahead and call God his name, but where do you get Jehovah from? <laughs> See what I mean? Like, what makes Latin so great? Also, keep in mind that Latin wasn't even out at the time of Moses. I don't know if this is important to you or not, but Latin wasn't a thing until a good deal after Moses. Okay, Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I believe Latin had its origin in like I want to say around 500 BC, but I'm really not sure. So don't quote me on that. I just know that it came out sometime after Hebrew, but before Greek, I think. But once again, I know Greek, not Latin. Just throwing it out there right now. I know Greek, not Latin, so I'm really not sure. Uh, but it comes out to I am who I am, but God's name is more than just a name. God's name is, like I said, it's about his character. It's about yeah. it's about his sovereignty. Even the word God, so impersonal, so blank, God. What does that, what's the definition of that? It's the one who created everything. In and of itself, just the name God, as bland as it is, God. See what I mean? It's not anything spectacular. It's not something that you'd see and think, wow, that's just such a great name that I've never heard before. It's just a real simple word meaning a creator. In fact, we use the exact same word for lesser beings, gods. See what I mean? We use the exact same, same word. Uh, it's nothing grand enough in itself, but it speaks of something greater. Speaks of a creator. Speaks of someone who's more than the created. See what I mean? Um, so I think that's more of what God's name has to do with is respect and honor, is is character, is is actions. Because the things that God does is based off of his character. They're one and the same. God can't act any different because that's who he is. Yeah. That makes sense? So, what single passage confirms the deity of Christ the most to you? When you read the Bible, what, what convinced you that Jesus is God? I think one of them for me is... When uh, John the Baptist, when he had his people go and ask Jesus yes. who he was, and he tells them, "Well, look at look at these things: the the lame are walking, the blind are seeing, and you know, go back and tell him these things." 
Yeah. I think for me that's one. Hmm. Okay. What do you guys think? What 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 passage really sticks out to you and says this is God? Yeah. His death and resurrection. Okay, so the parts in the Gospels. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nobody else would have done this for for mm. for people. Nobody. Maybe the the compassion that he sees for the hurting people, you know. Mm. Okay. You mean like in the Gospels? Yeah, in the Gospels. I mean, like you can see anybody on the earth, and some people have a lot of compassion, but I don't think nearly as much as people do. Hmm. Okay. So not really a passage specifically. Um, so much as the attitude of the passage and what what, what Christ did. I guess a little bit one that's coming to mind to me is whenever he uh, sees the crowd and he had compassion over the crowd. Uh, I think it's whenever uh, right before he was going to feed the 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, it, it it doesn't have to be exact. Um, another one that I had thought of the other day, last week actually, when we asked the question, um, was you don't realize there's that much traffic for here. Colossians 1, 13 through um, 16, mm. where it talks about, by him all things were created. Yeah, and yeah. Well, I looked that up um, about Latin, and it's saying that it started out um, from the Latium region, and then eventually got to Italy where it was made popular after the rise of uh, Rome and you know that that kind of thing then it started to spread as 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 the Roman Empire spread Latin kind of spread with it um, so we're looking at um, classical Latin being used in the 1st century BC through the 1st century AD and then vulgar Latin were um, used later than that I believe the Vulgate, which was the the Catholic uh, Latin Bible, which a lot of, they they still use a lot of times. Um, well, they still used it too. I think Martin Luther's uh, days. Um, I believe that was from the vulgar form of Latin. Uh, so it was technically, actually, it was about as old as Hebrew. Then that must mean, but um, was not in the area. Yeah, it couldn't have been in the area because there weren't the Latin speaking people in that area. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. So for God to have given him it and what then became Jehovah years later with no historical proof, you got to wonder why would Egypt be speaking Latin? Yeah. Not only that, but the old form of Latin. And why would God speak it to Moses to give to people who didn't speak Latin? Yeah. It's I mean, I guess you could try and figure out some way to get it to match, but I just don't see how you could. Anyways, sorry, I seemed a little preoccupied. I was looking that up while I was listening. Uh, anybody else? 
what's what passage or, or, or thing in the Bible really confirms to you this Jesus is God. Repeating the five thousand. Yeah. Definitely. What about it says this is God? Just the fact that he took the bread and the fish and made it multiply. Hmm. And just So the miracle itself. Mm. Okay. 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 Maybe whenever um, the uh, guy came up and said, "Hey, my daughter is dying. Can you um, can you just tell the say for her to be healed and she'll be healed?" And you know, all he had to do was say, "Be healed," and she was healed. Mm. He didn't have to go do his whole thing and try to get her to be healed by doing certain ceremonies and stuff. All he did have to do was speak the word. Mm. Hmm. So really, the, the the fact of his power. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're gonna look at a few passages here. As much as it depends on me, I like to give you guys. Yes, please. Uh, the John, the John one. Uh, actually, no. Do the Colossians one, because there's two of them there. Um. As much as it depends on me, I really like to give you guys historical fact, which is why I looked up that up about Latin. I don't like to give you guys facts that are just not facts. Right. I mean, so. So I mean, even think think about that though, guys. Seriously, think about that. Latin was this prehistoric language that came down to Italy, which they don't even know how it got there. Okay, just think about this. And didn't become a big thing until Rome started to gain steam, which was in, I want to say, like the 500s or, or 300s BC. You see what I mean? Like, I know my dates aren't exact right now. I know that. But even still, because when did Moses live? See what I mean? He lived all the way back in the 1400s. Yeah. That's a, that's, a, that's a good deal of time. That's almost a thousand years left here. And keep in mind that there's no historical proof of Latin being there at that time. See what I mean? So that would mean that the only logical explanation would then be somehow God's, God enabled Moses to understand Latin and gave it to him in Latin, if for Jehovah to have been his name. Or, which once again, we have no proof of that. So I guess it's possible that there's no proof of that. Or, that God gave Moses a false name and then later caused Charles Russell to understand it as Jehovah? I mean, I don't know. I, I'm really scraping the bottom of the barrels trying to understand how Jehovah could possibly be his name. I just don't see it. Genesis uh, 1, 26 through 27. I'm not going to turn to it. It says, Let us make man in our image. And he created them, male and female, in his image. Okay? All right? Who is us? God said it, so who is us? Let's go through the list of possibility. It could be an angel, right? Yeah. Angels are messengers. And nowhere is it recorded that they had anything to do with creation or with anything like that. So that brings up the question, who else could it be? Maybe it was another god. Maybe there were multiple gods. God says that there was no other god and that there will never be another god. So that leaves us with, so who was this us? And then we get to John 1, 1 through 3, which um, Job's Witness translation actually mistranslates. And the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, the Job's Witness translation reads, and the Word was a God. Okay, But it's going to contradict itself later on. Check this out. He was in the beginning with God, so it's separate from the Father. We know that. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So could it be a God? A created God? A lesser God? No, because he just said, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made which has been made. So, there, so there, it contradicts their translation of a God. Because it couldn't be a, a created lesser God. And Genesis said, let God say... I mean, I'm sorry. And Genesis said... God said, let us make man in our image. So he just said, God said that. And here he just said that Jesus was the one who did the creating. Okay. So I mean, so now we get to Colossians. For by him all things were created, 
both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I mean, I don't think Paul could have been any clearer, but go ahead and go to 2.9. For in him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. I mean, literally, John couldn't have, Paul, I'm sorry, Paul couldn't have been any clearer. He just said basically in a hundred different ways, Jesus is God. This God made everything. He does it for his own pleasure. He holds it by his own, by his own power. And he is the fullness of God. I mean, how much else do you want to say that Jesus was God? The man who was living on earth was God in human form. Okay, like... How how much clearer can you possibly be? Yeah. I, I don't understand where the confusion is. And then, once again, Genesis 1 said what? Let us make man in our image. And who said it? God. See what I mean? Like, at this point, I'm, I haven't even brought up the Holy Spirit yet. I'm just saying Jesus is God, regardless of the Holy Spirit at this point. And they can't even they can't even give a logical explanation of how that's true. But this is what they say: the Trinity is not logical. So you fix the illogicalness and unreasonableness of the Trinity by giving us another paradox. That doesn't give, make it any sense. So I mean, whatever. Um, you turn to the Exodus passages, and I'll go to Isaiah. Are you ready? Go ahead and read yours. You shall have no other gods before me. Okay, so there's that. For, for Isaiah 43 10 says, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no god was formed. And 14 says, Hold on just a second. Nor shall there be any after me. All right? But then he says, I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. <laughs> Did you hear what you just said? Yeah. I'm God. There's none, there's none before me or after me. I'm, I'm the only God that there is. So that was Jesus saying that. <laughs> that doesn't follow because he said, I, 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 I am the Lord. So, But if it's the Father who's saying it, that would mean that Jesus is also God, right. eternally existent. So go ahead and go to your uh, Exodus 34, 14. For you shall not worship any other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous god. So, Uh-oh. His name is Jealous now. Maybe we should change it to, from Jehovah's Witness to Jealous Witness. Uh, Isaiah 45, 5 says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Beside me there is no god. I equip you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, there is no other. Besides me there is no god. I equip you, though you do not know me. Yeah. I mean, it's abundantly clear by these passages. And keep in mind, I had to limit passages. Yeah. I could have started in Genesis and ended in Revelation. Yeah. I cut it way short. The first one shows that Jesus is, is God, that he created everything, and that proves that he's God. And the second one shows that there is no other God, so there couldn't be some kind of a system of an inferior and a superior, inferior and superior God. Yeah. So that doesn't work. So we have two equal beings who are God. But then right there, Isaiah just said there is no other. So that means we've got one God who is referred to in the plural, but is still one. Mm -hmm. And has distinctions between that role, between Jesus, the Son, and the Father. Okay? So now we've got a little bit of a... It's something that's hard to wrap our heads around, but still, that's what Scripture says, right? All right. So then we get to a few words that um, Jehovah's Witness love to twist. And I, these I want you guys to write down. The first is firstborn. Well, that means I've been yammering. Uh, it goes off whenever I've been talking too long. It says, hey, you shut up. Great, that's Gracie's favorite part. Uh, Colossians 1.15 says this. Um, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So what Jehovah's Witnesses do is they point to that, the firstborn of all creation. 
but they skip over the first part of that sentence. So let's go, go back to the first part. He is the image of the invisible God. Not made in the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God. Right. Uh, okay. Well, so let's go to the second part. The firstborn of all creation. What does that mean? Firstborn can mean can mean rank or pro or um, prominence, like in, 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 a, in a like a lieutenant. You know. Yeah. That makes sense. So uh, well, that's a poor way of describing it, but just roll with me on this. Um, and really, context is what decides what the word means. <coughs> and in this one, it's obviously saying the firstborn of all creation. He's, he's the one who is over all creation. And look, it goes on to say, For by him all things were created. What does that have to do with him being created first? It has everything to do with him having superiority over the creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he clarifies that in 2.9 and what we just read, where he says that all the for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells. He clarifies what he's saying. There's no possible way that this could be misinterpreted from Paul to say, "Hey, Jesus isn't God." There's no way this could be. This could mean that. Um, so it clarifies itself. Once again, look to Scripture to clarify itself. Um, only begotten. Um, well, John three sixteen says that Jesus is God's only begotten. Yes, and it also uses the exact same word in Hebrews eleven seventeen. What on, the word only begotten in Greek it's monogenes. I know the word by heart. What it means is special or unique. In Hebrews eleven seventeen he uses the exact same word for Abraham's second son. His second son, Isaac. It's talking about Abraham and it says his only begotten son, Ishmael. I'm I'm sorry, Isaac. Ishmael was his firstborn. And Ishmael was also blessed by God. But Isaac was the one that God chose for the people of Israel to come through. See what I mean? Once again, you really got to understand what they're saying. When, when they're talking to you, really listen to what they're saying because they're going to twist things on you. You got to make sure that you, that you know what they're saying and they know what they're saying. Um... Revelations, all throughout Revelations, it says this. I am the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, I don't know if I uh, explain this to you guys. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet, and Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. So you say I'm the first and the last. Um, uh, the beginning and the end. Um, and Jehovah's Witness will tell you undoubtedly that this is Jehovah. Because all throughout Revelations, he's talking about, you know, his... His power and, and his complete dominance as God. Yet in Revelations 2 8, it says, I am he who died and lives again. And so then it brings up the question if Jehovah is the Alpha and the Omega, same person, when did Jehovah die? He didn't. Jesus died. See? See what I mean? Um. John 1.18 says that nobody has seen God. Nobody has seen God. And then in the Bible you see a whole bunch of people who have seen God. Moses on the mountain. Genesis 32.30 I believe is Jacob at Peniel. Sees God. He says, I have seen God face to face, he says. It's very clear what's going on here. They saw a manifestation of God, the pre-incarnate, the pre-incarnate Jesus, before he was the fleshly being of Jesus. He appeared to people in a form, in a human form. Also, a lot of times he's called the angel of the Lord, and sometimes there is actually an angel that he sends, but sometimes he is the one that they call angel of the Lord. And then they realize, oh, it's God. So it really just depends the context. Um, Yeah, I mean, I, those verses just kind of really spell it out. But there's more. I mean, if you guys were really um, interested, you could go on for forever about it. Um, kind of don't want to run too long. Um, I'll skip some things. Um, no, I really want to get to biblical value next week.
I don't know. We'll just go and see what happens. I'll, uh, I'll stop around like 8, 8, 10. Okay, I won't, I won't stay real late. Um, who or what is the Holy Spirit? Who do you think the Holy Spirit is? Or what is it? God's presence. Okay. And that's actually what Jehovah's Witness say. It's, just, it's God's presence. Okay. Anybody else? Anything else? He's um, he is God. Okay. Um, his role, if you will, is to teach and comfort and guide us. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So if you notice, uh, Jack referred to referred to the spirit as a he, as a person. Right. I'm not talking about gender here, I'm talking about person. Okay. And that's also what we see in scripture. I'm just going to go through this real quickly. These are four different pa passages that all talk about the Holy Spirit and talk about him in very personal terms. Acts 5, 3 through 4 and um, 8, 29 talks about the Holy Spirit talking and the Holy Spirit doing things. In Acts 5, Peter says, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. And then he says, you haven't lied to people, but to God. He makes it abundantly clear that God is that Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is that God. Um, and in 829, it says that the Holy Spirit <coughs> sent them. It also talks about the Holy Spirit telling them stuff. If it's if the Holy Spirit is simply God's presence, it doesn't make sense that it's talking. So, I mean, it is the Holy Spirit is fully and completely um, God. And this is actually a very common view. People kind of see as you know, Jesus is the main deal. And then, like, the Father, you know, he has usefulness in the Old Testament, I guess, whatever. And then the Holy Spirit is just kind of, well, he's something. I guess he's there, or he, maybe he's, I don't know, whatever. See you know what I mean? And people just kind of have that view about the Holy Spirit. I, I mean, I'm not condemning anybody. I'm just saying it's a very common view. Uh, and I think that a lot of church direction is going to be found, and church victory, and church... Getting out into where God has called them to be, progression, progression, progression. is going to be found by people realizing that the Holy Spirit is for us today, and the Holy Spirit is, is fully God, and, and He is He is able to what Chuck just said, teach us. He's able to train us. He's able to do these things in and through us. See what I mean? So. It's amazing, like the Holy Spirit is like the gentle part of God. Yeah, but see, that's the thing, though. All of all the persons of the Trinity are all fully God, and they're all exactly all the fullness know, of God is in like, all of them. It's like our like we express emotions. Uh huh. It's like that's how it is. Like God expresses his emotion. Like mm. it's like his breath. Like, oh, I see what you're saying. You know what I mean? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, and so we have four different people here who all talk about the Holy Spirit in 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 ways that talk about him being God, and from different stages in life. Luke wrote in the '60s. John wrote in the 80s. Paul wrote in the Romans 50s. Isaiah wrote in, like, what, 700 BC? I can't remember the exact date, but he wrote, I mean, before <coughs> Jesus ever even came. So, I mean, this is something. Um, so how are we saved? Uh, I just put this in here, but we already talked about it um, before, so I'll just blow through it. Don't worry about that. Um, as Acts 2.38-39 says, you know, about uh, being saved by, by repenting, it's when you believe in God, you repent of your sins. It's something that kind of goes together. If you truly believe in God, if you, if you are truly trusting in God, you're going to repent of your sins because God just has a way of convicting us himself. And Chuck talk, talk, and you know, that sermon is just so relevant. I'm so glad I have it on my YouTube channel. On my YouTube channel is Chuck's sermon about how the Holy Spirit convicts versus how we guilt trip people. I don't remember exactly what it's called, but it's on there, Overcoming um, condemnation. condemnation. Yes, yes, Overcoming Condemnation. It's on my YouTube channel. If you can't find it, let me know. I will send it to you an email. I will put it on your Facebook, whatever. It's there. So, um, John 3, 16, if, so that if anyone would believe, you know, it, it, it's just thing after thing. It, it's about trusting in God. You know what confused me as a kid about being saved? The Bible nowhere says the ritual of being saved. Mm -hmm. 
it doesn't say you go to the altar and you say this and you do this and you're saved. It never says that. Instead, it shows us examples. It shows us examples. Why? Because they're not saved by ritual. It's not a repeat after me kind of deal. This is what it takes for salvation. A trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And when you do that, works will follow. Repentance will follow. The Holy Spirit will convict you. You'll start realizing the things that you should and shouldn't be doing. And you grow when you move on. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is working in you. That's just how it works. I mean, it's just a great thing. We really get the we really get the good end, and, and God is left with that little end of the stick. I mean, goodness sakes. Um, it's not by our works or abilities. It's not by how great you can do things. It's not how great you are. It's not how, you know, whatever. It's not by that. It's not by our association with a club, organization, or denomination. It doesn't matter if, you, if you're um, – if you are um, – uh, Calvinist or Armenian. It doesn't matter if you're Pentecostal or Baptist. It is, I mean, it doesn't matter those things. It doesn't matter if I'm part of the Lions Club. It doesn't matter. And that's what Jehovah's Witness make it about. You have to be part of our organization, part of our in-group club to be saved. And then, if you're truly one of us, you're going to go door-to-door -door irritating the crap out of people. Because that is necessary for salvation. No, it's not. And the Bible makes that abundantly clear. But anyways... These are just some tactics that people that, that Jehovah's Witness will use. Just want you guys to be aware of it. I mean, it's stuff that we talked about. They'll misquote people. They'll misquote verses. Uh, they will ignore the context of a passage. They'll just kind of throw stuff, and they'll do it real rapid fire, um, going from thing to thing to thing. They'll redefine terms. They could use a term like salvation. You think you know what it means, but they'll use it in a different way, and they'll just they'll just assume their meaning where it's like, oh, I agree with them, but that can't be right. And so they'll leave you just in a state of confusion because they're using the same words that you know. They're just using it in a different way. Um, they'll talk very quickly, go from point to point to point to point without giving you any time to, to think, and they'll just over flood you with, wait, what? Maybe I do agree with you. Maybe we are on the same page. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yeah. Because don't, don't be thrown off your guard when this happens. Um, and, or if you really know know what you're talking about and, and you try to actually have an intelligent conversation with them and they see that you know what you're talking about, they have a tactic called walking away, which means you have about two minutes to say anything worth saying that they're going to actually hear. In other words, chances are you're not going to witness – you're not going to get people saved by, by having the conversation at the door, just FYI. You know how many people – Jehovah's Witness I've known who have gotten saved through – the door, the conversation, arguments at the door. I have yet to meet one. <laughs> you know why? Because I don't think that it works. I'm convinced that it doesn't work. And I know people who do it. My dad does it on occasion. Chuck's dad. I don't know if he still does it, but he used to at least. Well, uh, he does if he gets the chance. He does if he gets the chance. Do you know what I mean? And I mean that's good, I guess. I mean especially if the Holy Spirit lays it on your heart to say something. But don't get too upset or offended if it's if the conversation doesn't go very well. It. I. I have yet to see it go well. That's their last ditch effort. If things start making sense, because check this out, they will actually get excommunicated if they um, start asking questions against what the teaching is, and that would mean they wouldn't be able to go to, go to heaven. So they're very nervous. And their family, stuff. right? Shut them out. Right. Which is funny because nobody follows that. But whatever, it's it's whatever. <laughs> Anyways, uh, it's just really intimidation scare tactics. Um, so the three things about how do you witness to, to Jehovah's Witness, and this this is really the last thing we're going to go over. I want you guys to write these three things down. This is going to be the most important thing that you can do to witness to Jehovah's Witness, okay? Number one, pray for their salvation, not against them. When we're praying for some Jehovah's Witness, a lot of times we do things like, God, humble them, take away your blessings, to destroy them by your – you see what I mean? We just pray all these really – cruel prayers but god says that his kindness leads people to repentance and i'm fully convinced that god wants us to pray for their salvation that god would send workers maybe see what i mean i'm, I'm fully convinced that we need to be praying for their salvation uh, maybe against the lies taking root maybe against satan's influence on them maybe you could pray against that but don't be real careful about about praying condemnation and curses on people, especially when God says specifically in his word, do not return cursing for, uh, uh, curses for curses. He says that in his word. So I think maybe you need to be really careful about that. Number two, continue to do good. 
You know what's going to speak wonders to the Jehovah's Witness? That this church over here is opening up a men's center to help people get off of drugs. It's it has an oasis youth youth center for kids to have somewhere to go that's safe and that's just fun for them that we don't charge for. That this church is doing uh, it does stuff for Halloween every year. So I mean that's that's just gonna matter. Keep doing good and it'll it'll matter. The truth draws people in. I don't know how he does it, but the Holy Spirit has his way. And they can deny him all that they want, but at the end of the day, it's going to be that same Holy Spirit that convicts them of, of just the need for more of him. See what I mean? Pretend like you are them and pray in that way. And third off, teach sound doctrine. In our churches, in our homes, wherever we are, we need to make sure that there is sound doctrine, tested doctrine, doctrine that is stable with the Word of God. Does that make sense? So those three things are going to be the single greatest way that you're going to witness to, to Jehovah's Witness. Not the arguments at the door, although they might have something to do with it. And you, you should, I mean, if you feel the Holy Spirit, you know, hey, don't run away from that. But be patient when you're talking with them. Genuinely listen and be loving, okay? Genuinely. Not just at the door, but everywhere to people. Listen to people when they're actually talking. Because you don't want to, excuse me, you don't want to get, get, be known for the reputation of just, you know, cutting people off all the time and never listen yeah. to anything that people say and, I mean, that's just bad. I mean, do things lovingly. I mean, if you're gonna do if you're gonna do something to, for somebody else, do it out of love. Don't just do it out of obligation. Um, stick to the most important areas of discussion. I mean, don't don't let it go go off about the end times and about whether there's eternal judgment. Unless you really feel like that's an important area of discussion, let it be about Jesus or the Holy Spirit or salvation, because those are the most important things, and the rest will follow. You know what I mean? They need to know that they don't have to do these things to be saved. Jesus' blood atones us. They need to know that Jesus is God. So, I mean, that's 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 num job number one. That's the most important thing there. Um, and don't attack them when you're talking to them. It, it, a lot of times we just get in a thing of just viciously attacking them with our words. I'm not talking about like beating them though. You shouldn't do that. <laughs> I'm talking about um, you know, where it's like you're on a mission to make them feel stupid. You know what I mean? You start just saying things ruthlessly. It's like Okay, all right, calm down there. So, any questions about that? About Joe's Witness? We've we've gone over Joe's Witness before. Uh, I've hit it a couple times besides that time that I hit it for like three or four weeks. So I wanted to hit it again on the major things that, that bullets him right there on the wall. It has a breakdown of, of uh, cults and religions and compares our views with their views. If you guys have any more questions, you can look at that. Or you can put a question in the question box and I will make sure to get to it. Okay. Um, but that's the main areas of discussion that differ with those from the Jehovah's Witness. They believe in salvation through works. They believe that Jesus is not God. They don't even believe that, that the Holy Spirit is a person. And, uh, yeah. Most important things there. So the question of the week, unless you guys had something to ask. How are you supposed to see yourself? Biblically speaking, how are you supposed to see yourself? A lot of people talking bad about themselves and how wicked they are. And you hear a lot of people talking about how um, their power is within themselves and how great of a person they are. So, I mean, how are you supposed to see yourself biblically? Mm. No questions about Joe's Witness? I was hoping so, because that means that last time we talked about it, it gave you enough of an Isn't idea. Yeah. yeah. Good. So then next week we'll talk about.